Okay, to get down to business then, we're, we're back talking about, about subroutines and um, we were exploring the connection, rough, loosely, the, the relation there was between a, a subroutine and, say, a function or a procedure in a high-level language. And last day we had a look at how you might implement uh, a simple C procedure uh, for calculating the max of two integers and returning the result. Uh, we, would, we implemented that using uh, passing the, the parameters on the stack. Now, it's an awkward way to do it, and a decent optimizing compiler would optimize away most of the transactions to and from memory. Nevertheless, what we saw on uh, Thursday is pretty close to what, say, a compiler of the late 1970s or the 1980s would have done at the time. The 68000 was designed, uh, I haven't said this before, it was designed actually supposedly to make it easier to be a target for the compilers of the time. The compilers of the time were not nearly as sophisticated as they are now. Okay, so I want to explore a little more the idea of uh, the stack and the idea of a stack frame. Uh, I said on uh, Thursday that uh, a stack frame, that's the, the, the thing that comes into existence on the stack, and let's just go through what might be in it. There'll be parameters, there'll be a return address, there'll be local variables, and maybe stored register uh, contents, uh, all belonging to one call to a procedure. And that's called a, loosely called a stack frame. So these stack frames effectively correspond, in a sense, to the procedure uh, as it's running at that time. Now imagine you had two procedures, two identical, uh, well I should say two copies of the same procedure running. Um, they would each have separate parts of the stack. Okay, So in that sense the stack frame, the each individual procedure's stack frame would represent that individual instance of that procedure running. Um, and uh, So that's very nice. Now if you imagine um, uh, say a main program uh, which calls on a procedure which in turn calls on another procedure which may call on another procedure you can imagine that each of them has a stack frame even the main program will have a kind of a stack frame and so what you'll have is a sort of a, a stack with these stack frames dispersed down through it um, when a procedure is running its stack frame is in existence and it runs within the context of that stack frame but sometimes a procedure will want to get at, say, a variable that belongs to its caller. So a caller might have, say, a variable A defined within its own scope, uh, and the uh, call E, the procedure, might want to reference that. Now, the caller's uh, variable may well be local to that caller. Okay, in other words, it'll be in that caller's stack frame. So your function, when it starts running as um, having been called by the caller, it will have to get back to the caller's stack frame. So you have all these stack frames in memory, in the stack, and you may wish to get from one stack frame to its parent, so to speak, or to its parent's parent and so on. You might want to, as they might say, walk uh, the stack, walk along the frames uh, that are within the stack. Now, to complicate matters, these frames will be of variable size, depending on the number of parameters, the number of local variables and all that kind of stuff, they'll be of varying size. So you can't assume they're always going to be, say, 30 bytes <coughs> in size. Uh, although some, 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 uh, in some situations you can make that assumption, but generally you can't. So the, um, the 68000 has made it a little simpler to link stack frames together. Okay? It's got a couple of instructions uh, to link stack frames together. And stack frames, while you might not use them when you're writing high performance assembly language code yourself, um, you certainly would uh, expect them to be used by a compiler. Even a modern compiler will use stack frames. Okay, so what am I saying here? Uh, just talking about stack frames in general, the stack frame corresponds to a separate copy, ah yeah. Uh, oh yeah, I'm just trying to make the point in this uh, slide here, this overhead here, that stack frames are very useful because they come into existence when a procedure is called they stay in existence while the procedure is running, and they go out of existence when the procedure exits. And so their existence corresponds to the lifetime of local variables. And that's why you would assign uh, space in a stack frame for local variables. Now, I'm talking here principally about the language C. Uh, C++ is a, a little bit different in that uh, you have what are called blocks within C++, where you can have variables 
uh, local variables coming into existence and existing only for the duration of that block. In C, local variables have, uh, in, in strictly C, local variables have a lifetime equal to the lifetime of the procedure that they're, they're in. So that's how it's implemented, by allocating space on the stack. Even C++, uh, where necessary, will push local variables into the stack and take them back out again. Okay, so linking stack frames, which is what I was talking about. Okay, so the 68,000. So here's a picture of the stack with, um, you know, I've recycled this picture. You might, see, you might have seen a version of it in the previous slide. Uh, but you, the, the different colors here correspond to different stack frames. So this is the, this is the lowest end, low, low memory addresses, high memory addresses. So this would be the newest stack frame. So you might imagine, say, that this is the stack frame belonging to the main program. And it calls on a, a, a procedure or a function which allocates this stack frame. It, in turn, has called uh, another, uh, another uh, procedure which has this stack frame, and so on, all the way down here. Okay? So uh, most recently, a procedure has been called, and its stack frame is this thing here. If it wanted to get uh, hold of a variable that was within the scope of this procedure here, it would have to walk up along the uh, frames in order to, to get to that stack frame and then reference the variable. Now that walking can be quite costly by the way, okay? Uh, uh, it, it can be of order the number, the depth of the, of the call of the procedures. Uh, typically when you want to get at the stack frame of the main program, the, the top level program, uh, you use an absolute memory address. The compiler will have a, an absolute memory address pointing to it or an absolute pointer point. <coughs> okay, so the 68000 then has two instructions aimed at making this uh, construction of these uh, link uh, effect here easy. One is called the link <coughs> instruction and the other is called the unlink. Yes, sir? What exactly is a function What exactly is a function, a function instance? A function instance is a separate <coughs> copy of a function. Now, what I was trying to think of was um, let's imagine that you have a, um, a situation where you have two processes, right? One is running and one is not running at any instant. But let's imagine that both processes call on the same procedure, okay? Uh, so the procedure might be that procedure we wrote the other day, max, okay? Um, process one will call on max and it will have its own copy of the procedure max running. So that would be one procedure instance and process 2 will have its copy of the procedure max running with its set of variables, and that's another instance. Okay? The instances, so uh, just a separate, um, yeah, separate instance, what's another word for it? A separate, you can think of it as a separate copy, almost like two separate copies. Uh, the thing about them is that they are uh, separate copies of the same thing, uh, so they're separate instances of the same thing. Is that okay? For the moment, anyway. Yeah. Okay. Now the link instruction uh, allows you to construct uh, one of these links here, uh, and the unlink at the start of a procedure, and the unlink instruction allows you to uh, deallocate or get rid of it at the end. So if you were to look at the code produced by a compiler for a 68,000 going back a little, uh, a small number of years, you'd find that a subroutine, or that a procedure is turned into a subroutine, and at the start of the subroutine, the housekeeping would be, um, to uh, the very first thing would not be to move multiple the, the registers that you're going to change. The very first thing would be to uh, set up a link, the link register, using the link instruction. So the first thing would be to set up a link. The second thing would be to um, save the registers using move multiple. And then you would get down to the body of the subroutine, you'd execute the code in the subroutine. Then at the very end, uh, to exit, you would uh, move the register contents back uh, to restore their original values. You'd unlink uh, the, this uh, link, the stack frame link, and then you'd return. So you'd have two special sort of housekeeping instructions at the start, link and move multiple. At the end, you'd have three, you'd have unlink, but you'd have move multiple, unlink, and return from subroutine. Uh, so I invite you to have a look. You're gonna to have to look at the uh, link and unlink instructions. Now, you should go back to the website and, have, and download one of those 68,000 manuals, either the user's manual or the programmer's manual. Those things are dead. The, the links, they were dead until about half an hour ago. 
program. I, when I went to do the same thing, I found that the uh, the update of the website was incomplete, I'm sorry to say, so they should all be working out. Okay, but if they're not, please let me know. Uh, the link is quite a complicated instruction, and we might take um, a tutorial on Thursday where you'll use it. There's one other thing that the link instruction is very useful for, even if you don't want to use the functionality of linking back through stack frames, and that is this. Suppose you're writing a program, and, uh, or sorry, suppose you're writing a subroutine, and you uh, know that the parameters are going to be passed on the stack. Let's say that, okay? Uh, so they'll be in the stack, and when the subroutine is called, there'll be the return address there as well, okay? Now, as things stand at the moment, you have to work out in advance how many registers you're going to save, okay? In order to work out how far back up the stack you have to go to reach any of the parameters. Now that's a mess because very often you don't know in advance how far back you have to go uh, in, order to, uh, in order to reach the parameters because you don't know how many registers you're going to save. What you can do instead to get around that problem is to use a link instruction uh, to put, as it were, a fixed point in the stack frame from which you can reference back up to the, uh, to the parameters. Okay, so the link instruction is very useful as a sort of a, a, a a sort of a platform almost in the stack for off of which you can reference the parameters without having to worry about how many register contents you save, whether it's two registers or four registers or no registers. So the link instruction is very useful uh, for that. And maybe we'll take an example in the tutorial uh, to get you to, to look at that. Okay, so the link and unlink instructions. Typical complex instruction set computer uh, <coughs> instruction does a few things, okay? Uh, if you were implementing it on a RISC machine, you'd require uh, three instructions, actually. You'd require <coughs> three instructions to implement the link, because it does three separate things. But have a look in the, uh, uh, in the uh, programmer's or user's manual. In the programmer's and user's manual, you'll find talk about 68,000, 68,020, 030, 008, and a whole lot of other instruction sets stick strictly to the 68,000 instruction set. So that's one thing. The other thing is that every instruction uh, has a one or possibly two page explanation of what it does, right? So have a look. Uh, your time will be rewarded. Okay. I'd really like to go on about that, but uh, I'm not going to do it right now. So I want to start talking about instruction encoding. Um, I'm not going to get down into the detail of exactly how instructions are encoded. Now that's the job of an assembler. The assembler knows what codes to use. But um, we, we are going to have a look at instruction encoding because uh, it's the key to understanding uh, how fast instructions execute on the 68,000 circuit. Okay? So we want to have a look at uh, instruction encoding with a view to working out how fast instructions execute. But we'll also use it later to have a look, not too much later, just to have a, a sort of a brief overview of how an or what an assembler <coughs> program that converts your, your code, your assembly language code into machine code, we want to have a look at what it does, what the assembler actually does. So we need to look at encoding schemes, and it's actually very simple. The idea is very simple because 68,000 is so elegant and so old that uh, the approximations we, we're going to make uh, work uh, to a very large extent. Okay. Um, so the approximation, I can tell you what the approximation is here. The approximation we're going to make here is that the operational part of an instruction, a move or an add or a multiply or a divide or compare or clear, that those uh, operations take no time at all to execute on the 68,000. So that's our approximation. So all the time that's taken by instructions in a 68,000 is taken by fetching them and by fetching any operands that are associated with the instruction. So we're going to discount uh, the time it takes uh, to actually perform the operation in question, whether it's a, uh, an add or a compare or something like that. Now it's an approximation, and we will, we, will, we will tune up the approximation a little bit later, but we'll start off with that approximation. If we can work out how much time it takes to fetch the instruction and to fetch any operands associated with the instruction, and maybe to put away operands afterwards back into memory, then we can use that to estimate how long an instruction takes to execute. That's it, okay? So that's the approximation. Um, it's, it's approximate, but it's pretty accurate in the 68,000. 
Um, it's not very accurate on much more modern machines. So it wouldn't be more. It wouldn't be all that accurate in, say, the PowerPC or in the Intel 8086 family, uh, uh, and so on, or the, or maybe even the ARM. The reason is that uh, it uh, does not take into account the effect of instruction and data caches. Now they will make um, instruction fetching uh, and data fetching, generally speaking, considerably faster, very considerably faster. So, but even in those cases, uh, the utility of adopting this approach is that you'll get a very worst case, that's the slowest possible execution time. You get the worst case estimation of execution time using this approach, okay, using this approach. Uh, and that's very useful if you're uh, interested in making sure your program works uh, within a particular amount of time in the worst case, say in a real-time situation. Okay, so we begin. Um, you'll remember that everything is encoded in binary. Now, just to refresh your memory, everything means the instructions <coughs> themselves, like move or add or whatever, the operands, whether they're numbers or characters or floating point numbers or matrices or uh, whatever they happen to be, sets, doesn't matter. Uh, and the addressing modes themselves, how you reference these things, is also encoded for <laughs> binary. So the addressing mode, uh, address register indirect with pre-decrement, that's got a particular code in binary. Now, if we were talking about a reduced instruction set computer, a risk machine, then uh, it's a feature of risk machines that every instruction it's a coded in binary occupies the same amount of space, um, usually uh, 32 bits, well, not invariably, usually 32 bits. And that makes it much easier for the hardware of the risk to work out uh, uh, what's happening, what's about to happen, uh, looking into the instruction screen, looking further ahead in the instruction screen. Because it knows that if it goes 32 bytes or 30, 32 bits ahead of where it is now, it'll see the next instruction. Uh, 32 more bits will get at the one after and so on. Now, in a complex instruction set computer, such as a 68000, uh, instructions will be of varying length. Okay? And that makes it a lot harder to look ahead as it happens. And so that's one of the reasons that the uh, uh, looking ahead is much harder on a complex instruction set computer. Okay? They're of variable length. And uh, in the 68000, they have this notion of uh, the instruction being at least one word long, and that word is always called the operation word. Now, if you're used to other um, six, other uh, machines, you might have heard of a thing called a thing called an op code, an operation code. The thing, the difference we see between an operation word and an operation code, well, an operation code just specifies, as I say, add a multiplier divide and so on. The operation word contains effectively the op code plus more information as well, as we will see. Uh, and so a 68,000 will have at least one operation word and will have zero or more extension words. Okay, that means that we can now straight away make an upper speed estimate of a 68,000 instruction. Okay, if the 68,000 instruction contains no extension words uh, and we assume that the operation takes no time and requires no fetching of operands because they're all in the, in the, re in, in the processor, uh, in registers, then we can say that a 68,000 instruction takes as long as it takes to fetch one word. That's it. Okay, that's the upper speed limit, like the speed of light uh, in uh, physics, supposedly. Uh, we can say that a 68, that the very fastest the 68,000 could run down a hill with a trailing wind, you know, and good air pressure and all that kind of stuff, is um, as long as it takes to fetch one operation word, and that takes. On the 68,000s that were in the uh, original Mac Plus, which is going back a long way, fetching one word takes a half a microsecond. Okay, so that means that the 68,000 on a good day, uh, all things go on its way, has a maximum instruction execution rate of about two million instructions per second, two MIPS. Okay, now that thing over there has an instruction execution rate of about 2,000 MIPS on a good day down a hill with a trailing wind. Okay? Nevertheless, this is how you would estimate uh, its, its uh, highest speed in that worst case scenario. Okay? But unfortunately, it's much slower than two million instructions, uh, two, million instru two MIPS, millions instru two million instructions 
per second. It's a good bit slower than that. Not that it matters all uh, that much. So the overview of effect of executing an instruction on any machine, uh, but particularly in the 68000, is this. Uh, the first thing it'll do, so this is being done in hardware. This is not a software uh, algorithm. This is being done by the, by the synchronous logic in the machine. Okay, so the first thing it's going to do, uh, you can imagine, is it's going to fetch the operation word. That's the, uh, the, the very first part of the instruction that will contain considerable amount of information about the nature of the instruction uh, we'll we, we, we see in a few, in a few moments. Uh, it'll have to decode the operation word. Okay, so the so the operation word comes in. It comes in across the bus, lands in a, a holding area, has to be decoded by the logic of the of the processor, uh, and the decoding then uh, will determine what the 68,000 hardware does next. Uh, but one of the things that the, the the hardware may do next is to fetch the rest of the instruction. So if it can determine that there's more to the instruction by looking at the operation word. It will, start, it will start fetching the rest of the instruction. And it's a variable length instruction, so you'll have, uh, the operation word will have been fetched at this stage, and there will be zero or more uh, extension words, zero to four, actually, zero to four extension words uh, to be fetched, okay? And we'll see what's in those extension words in a little while, and you'll see how to figure out how many extension words there be, and so on and so forth. Um, once the uh, extension words have been fetched, uh, the instruction, the complete instruction will be in the processor. And you can imagine that what's going to happen then is uh, the uh, hardware will determine whether there are any operands to be fetched. So typically, for example, uh, an operand might be in a, me in a memory location, and it'll have to be fetched. It could be a byte or a word or a long word, or maybe in the case of move multiple, a succession of long words. But in any case, it's going to have to fetch uh, those off-processor operands, right? Okay, so you fetch the operation word, fetch any extension words, fetch the off-processor operands. So you can see all this, all this is going to involve the bus to get the information from memory or from peripherals into the machine, okay? Once everything is in the processor somewhere, the operation itself can be performed. And we're assuming, as our approximation, that that takes no time. Now it turns out that, of course, it does take a little bit of time but that time is hidden uh, from view, essentially, uh, as we'll see. Okay, but our approximation is that it takes zero time. And then once the operation has been performed, let's say it's an add or a compare or something like that, then it may be necessary to get, take the results and to put them back to memory off the processor. Like basically, if the thing has to go off processor, it's going to take time. Now, these asterisks here uh, indicate that no bus operations take place as a result of the while these things are going on. So the operation word is fetched, and so the operation word is now in memory and it's being decoded there. Okay, it's in, not, not giving rise to any operations on the bus. Uh, likewise here, when the operation is being performed, uh, it's not giving rise to any bus traffic. Okay, so in both of those cases, there's no bus traffic. There's gonna be bus traffic here, there's gonna be bus traffic here, and there'll be bus traffic here. Now, the instructions may not do all these things. So, for example, if there are no extension words, there will be no fetching of extension words. Uh, if there are no off-processor or operands, there will be no fetching of them. Um, and if, there's no, if there are no results to be put back out into memory or out to, out to a peripheral, then there will be no put-away, as it's called, the put-away phase. Right. Uh, so, that's how the instruction is going to get executed. Now... What's going to be in what? Well, I think I might have a picture coming up here. So let's let's see if we have this. Yeah, this is the way it would look. This is the way things would look. Uh, the PC, um, just for example, the program counter is pointing at an instruction that's going to be executed, and you can see it's going to take one to five words. Yes, sir. Um, what exactly would that process? Sorry, what it what would be? An off processor. An on processor. Well. An off processor. Yeah. Okay. Well, I'm glad you asked me that question. Uh, the the um, the situation is roughly speaking that the 68000 is implemented as a single chip, okay, single piece of silicon, and all of the registers, like the data registers and the address registers, the program counter itself, the status register, they're all in the chip. They're all so so th it takes no time at all to reference those, and they're all 
in processor operands. Off processor operands are everything else, everything that has to be fetched across the bus. Okay. Um, so an instruction then is going to look like zero to, f or sorry, I should say one to five uh, words. And you might imagine that that this picture contains uh, that, that information. Okay, zero uh, or more extension words. Okay, so what's going to be in the operation word is going to be the op code, as it would have been called on, on older systems. So it would specify, for example, the operation itself. Is it add or move or compare or so on? The size of the operation. Okay, is it is it if you have to specify it, say dot w, uh, and so on, dot l. So that's going to be in the operation word. Remember, the operation word is 16 bits wide. Um, the second kind of thing that's going to be in the operation word is uh, the uh, kinds of addressing modes to be used. Okay. So, for example, if the first operand is to be fetched using data register direct, that information will be part of the op word. Uh, if the if the first operand is to be fetched using uh, absolute memory long, then that specification will be in the operation word. The specification in that case will be that you're using absolute memory long. What would not be in the operation word is the actual address itself. Why not? <coughs> Logically. Yeah, because the address is going to be a 32-bit quantity, so there's no room for it in the operation word. So you're going to have to you're going to have to spill that over. So you might logically expect that the uh, that if you have a 32-bit address, it's going to take two extension words to specify. But back in the operation word, the specification of how the operandus can be fetched is there. So you might say it might have within it that the first operand is to be uh, accessed using absolute memory long. So it'll have that, but it won't have the actual address itself. Um, what else will it have? Uh, It'll have the registers themselves. So let's say you say, okay, this um, this reg this operand here is going to be accessed using data register direct. That'll be in the operation word, but also the register in question, D4, for example, or D7, whatever. Uh, the register specification itself will be there. There's one exception to that which we haven't come across yet. It's a fancy addressing mode, which we'll talk about later. So again, uh, we can we can imagine for the sake of simplicity, that uh, whatever registers uh, are being used to reference address uh, operands, those will be specified in the operation word. So it contains the opcode, the size, uh, the uh, kinds of addressing modes, and the registers involved, uh, with one exception. It will also contain quick, immediate operands. Okay? So add quick, subtract quick, move quick. The quick values themselves uh, will be stored within the operation word. And so you can see um, it's possible that you might get away with having no extension words with a quick immediate instruction, and that will make it quicker, hence the, hence the term. But just think about this. Uh, in the case of the move quick instruction, this, the number of bits allocated to the operand is eight, eight bits. Right? So half of the operation word in the case of move quick, half of it is devoted to that quick operand. Right? So you can see you're, you're devoting a lot of very precious space in the operation word uh, to the quick operand. And three bits are devoted to the quick operand in the case of add quick and subtract quick. Okay. So what's not in the operation word must be in the extension words. Right? So let's think what they could be. Uh, can anybody guess? We've already got one guess over our one statement here that uh, if you specify an absolute memory long address, that's going to have to take up uh, extension words. The actual address is going to take two extension words. Remember, absolute long address is a 32-bit address. 32 bits is two words, so it'll take two extension words to specify. What else do you think might be out there? Well, there'll be absolute memory long. Okay, that'll be 32 bits. And there'll be absolute memory short, which is 16 bits. Remember, absolute memory short is only a 16 bit. Any any guesses as to what else might be out there? Immediate hmm? Immediate yeah, who's saying that? Sorry. Immediate yes, immediate values. values. Okay. So if you have a byte immediate value, now we're not talking about quick immediate, which is regular immediate immediate values, a byte or a word or a long word. Well, clearly, uh, a word will take an extension word. A word immediate value will take an ex one extension <coughs> word. A long word immediate value will take uh, two extension words. And uh, I haven't said this, but uh, an attempt is made to make sure that 
uh, these instructions are have an even number of bytes in them. So a byte immediate operand is still going to take a full one word extension. Okay, it's not smart enough to do anything with that. Okay, so we'll have uh, absolute addresses will be out here, immediate operands will be out here, and I actually uh, introduced without telling you uh, an extra addressing mode the other day when I was referencing things in the stack. Do you remember that? I had, say, 4 past A7 and minus 7 past A7 and all those kind of things. I better talk a little bit more about it, but that's called address register indirect with offset. And an offset would also be stored out here. Okay? So the kinds of things you'd have in the extension words are immediate operands, and memory addresses, absolute memory addresses, and offsets. Uh, offsets. And one other thing which we talk about in connection with this exception later. So that means then that by looking at an instruction, by looking at an instruction as written, you could work out uh, the size of the instruction. And you could also think about how the instruction operands could get fetched. And so you could actually work out the total number of bus transactions, shall we call them, that would be needed to fetch that instruction, uh, its extension words, uh, all its operands, and to do a put away. And that's how you calculate how long the instruction takes to execute. So let's try it out. Okay. So I'm going to I'm going to move up this um, screen here, and um, if I may, I'm just going to clear the screen. I'm going to try to clear the screen. Imagine it's this one here. Now we have to walk through it pretty carefully. Move a long word from D0 to uh, A4. Okay, now we have to try and visualize what's going on here. Okay, so we have the possibility of, we have the certainty of an operation word and the possibility of extension words. And we have to work out all the bus activity that, that this instruction gives rise to. So what I've said is, uh, the operation word, okay, so the operation word is going to contain, and I want to do this sort of pictorially, okay? The operation word will contain, in respect of that instruction, it will contain the following, right? It will contain the operation itself. So it will contain the fact that it's move. Right? Okay, so it will contain the operation. It will contain the size of the operation. So we get the dot L there. It will contain the fact that the first operand is to be referenced using data register direct. So if I can just put in here for the moment DN, okay, so that it's using some register. And it will also contain the fact that the second operand is using address register direct, uh, AN. Okay, so it will contain all that. It will also contain the register values themselves, the register numbers themselves. So it will contain the fact that that n is actually 4, sorry, 0, pardon me. And it will contain the fact that this one here is 4. So in other words, it contains the complete instruction. The complete instruction. So that means, so that's the first thing. So we don't need any extension words. Sorry, I may have mis-said that. I, 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 I'll just go back over it. I may have uh, confused you. What would be in the operation word is the fact that it's a move, the fact that it's long, the fact that the first operand is accessed uh, using data register direct, and the fact that the second operand is, is accessed using address register direct, plus the fact that the first operand's data register direct register is D0, okay. and that the second address register direct's address register is A4, not the actual contents of the registers. Yes? How many, um, how many bits would, would each of them take up? 
how, how many bits um, how many bits would each of these take up well I don't actually know right I imagine it's four bits okay uh, three bits would be sufficient to specify which of the eight data registers okay or which of the eight address registers but you'd also have to you'd have to specify whether it was a data register or an address register so it seems to me that's an extra bit so, but I'm only guessing uh, the place to get the definitive poop on these is actually that uh, manual, the programmer's manual. It will tell you how they're encoded. But logically, it can't be less than, than, uh, than four bits, seems to me. Okay? Logically, but then, you know, your mileage will vary. Okay, so it, it appears to take no, ex no more extension words to completely specify that instruction. Well, now, when the instruction executes, when the instruction executes, when it actually is performed, um, is it going to give rise to any further activity on the bus? And the key, which I think was behind the question that was asked here earlier, the key is to work out whether the operands in question are already on chip in the processor or not. If they're in registers, they're in the processor. If, if they're uh, not in registers, then uh, somehow... Um, they will have to be fetched. If they're at memory locations, specifically, if they're at memory locations, then they will have to be fetched. Well, what's the story? Uh, is the first operand out in memory? Huh? No, it's not. It's in a register. Okay. The second, and its destination <coughs> is in a register. So there's going to be no extra traffic uh, on the bus because you're just moving something from one register to another. So there'll be no uh, operand fetch, let's say. Uh, zero, and there'll be no operand put away. It really is called put away. Zero. Okay, so the total budget for this instruction is there's going to be uh, one word read <coughs> on the bus. So this instruction should take about half a microsecond on the 68,000. That's on a, an 8 megahertz 68,000. Okay, pretty slow uh, machine nowadays. Okay, so that's one. That's a very simple example. Let's take another example. Let's take an example. Um, we take another another move example. And we go uh, and we say, okay, I want to move a byte, we'll say, okay, from, let's say, location uh, uh, FF304060 to, say, D4. Move a byte, okay. Use an, an absolute memory long uh, reference for the first operand and it's going into a data register, right? So let's, let's see how we get on with this one. Upward. Okay, well the operation word will contain the following information, okay? It'll contain the fact that it's a move, the fact that it's a byte, the fact that the first <coughs> operand is absolute <coughs> memory long, I'll just put that in triangular brackets there. You know, the fact that that's the addressing mode that's being used, and the fact that the uh, the destination, the second uh, uh, operand, is specified using <coughs> data register direct, and the fact that its register is data register four. Okay, so that's what's going to be in the operation word, right? The move, the byte, the absolute memory long, and D four, but not the actual location itself. So that's going to take up two extension words. And um, they will have to be fetched. Okay, so the first extension word will be FF304060, and the second extension, sorry, <laughs> that's the first extension word, and the second one is 4060. Okay, so two extension words. So this is, sorry, this is not to scale, okay, this, is, this here is one word. <coughs> This here, let me just redraw it to make it a bit more 
a bit more obvious. Okay, so extension works. Okay, so the complete instruction then is uh, encoded using six bytes. Uh, the operation word contains most of it, most of the sense of it, but the extension words contain the actual addresses themselves. Okay. So I'll, I'll finish up, I realize it's 10 to 1. So, we have to read the instructions, operation word and extension word. It's going to take three words to read the full instruction. And then, well, let's think about it. Once it knows where the byte is, it's going to have to read that byte as well across the bus. The byte is off chip because it's not in a register. Uh, it's got to be in memory, so it's going to have to be fetched across the bus. And it's going to take the bus is able to, to transmit or carry one word at a time, uh, uh, and one byte will fit into a word. So we'll have uh, uh, operand fetch one. So from F F three O four O six O. Once the once the byte has been carried across the bus into the processor, it's going to be put into D four. So it's not going to be going back out again. So there's going to be no put away. Zero. Zero put away. So our total is going to be three words to be read on, the, sorry, I beg your pardon, four words, four words, three, three words and one byte, four words to be read on the bus. The bus is, is one word wide. It's like a double barrel gun, uh, each barrel worth one byte. So if you want to fetch one byte, you're gonna to have to fetch a word containing that byte. So it's effectively four words of bus activity. So this is going to take about two microseconds. <coughs> okay, so whereas one version of the move instruction takes a half a microsecond, this takes two microseconds, all on the basis of assuming that the operation itself, whether it's move or add or whatever, doesn't take any time once everything is in the processor. Okay, thank you for your attention and we'll see you tomorrow. <coughs>